Hello and welcome to the Quad City Wood Turners YouTube channel. This video is going to be on turning a segmented bowl. This video is geared towards people who haven't ever uh, done any segmented turning or assembled a bowl. I've taken the hard part out of it and I've cut all the pieces for you. So down at the club, if you're a club member, you can purchase this bag of parts for $10. I donate all the wood to the club and get you started this way uh, with all the pieces. You're going to need a lathe and some accessories that we'll talk about during the video to complete this, but primarily a bowl gouge, a scraper, and a set of cold jaws for your chuck would be very handy to have for this assembly. This bowl is made out of uh, butternut because I happen to have a surplus of butternut in my shop right now. But the nice thing about butternut is it's a it's an attractive wood. It, it looks a lot like uh, white oak. Uh, however, it's a softer wood. It's you know uh, sometimes known as white walnut because it's about that hardness. But I think it's even a little softer than uh, black walnut. It's uh, a good, easy wood to turn. It machines easily on the table saw, and uh, you shouldn't have any trouble assembling it. So uh, stay tuned, and we will uh, go from this bag of parts to a finished bowl. So um, we're going to work with some lumber that I have in my shop. I acquired it a couple of years ago and the person uh, that was selling the lumber told me that it had been in storage in his uh, uncle's garage for about 30 years. So I'm pretty confident of the stability and the dryness of the lumber. Uh, I have it stored in my shop up here on racks and uh, in another room. My shop is also climate controlled, um, air conditioned in the summer, heated in the winter, it's in my basement. So that affects um, kind of the stability of the lumber also. So it's important to remember um, that when you're going through this process, because if you were to use something like this uh, with green lumber, logs that are cut, um, you may or may not uh, have very desirable results. I would almost certainly say that you will not have desirable results because that lumber is not stable as, as far as moisture is concerned and it's going to move quite a bit as it dries out. So what we're going to work with today is here on my table saw. I happen to have quite a bit of butternut so I thought I would use that. Once again, this wood is donated uh, to the club. Club members can buy these kits for $10. So the first step in processing this lumber is going to be to take it over to the joiner and uh, put a straight and square edge on two sides. Once we've done that, I'll take it over here to the table saw and we're gonna rip it down to about 13 sixteenths in thickness, uh, maybe seven eighths. And I use the table saw for this just because it's quick and efficient. You could also use a band saw with a rip blade if you have it tuned up well and have a good blade on that. You'd probably be sacrificing a little bit less wood doing it that way because of the thickness of the blade involved. This is a full one inch, inch thick uh, circular saw blade here. After we've got them uh, dimensioned to the rough thickness of either 13 sixteenths or 7 eighths, just somewhere in that range, I'll take it over here to my planer and I'll run it through the planer for the final thickness. And we're looking for exactly three quarter inch thick pieces. Now you can do your segments in any thickness that you want. However, the plans that I'm using here are four three quarter inch thick boards and that just happens to be a very common size and if you were to buy um, wood from say you know Lowe's or Home Depot or Menards or somewhere where it's um, already been um, already been machined to thickness for you then it'll be probably three quarters of an inch thick. So the next step in that process after we have them all dimensioned properly uh, is to cut them to width. Now I use a website called 
uh, segmentedturning.com to get my uh, initial plans. And then since then, I've kind of tweaked things to my liking off of that website. However, um, you can use a chart like this, which he has available on his website, which is going to tell you the uh, width of each board, um, the length of each segment, what the glue up diameter will be, etc. And then I went and calculated the board length for each board or for each bowl rather so that I know in each uh, size of stick of lumber if you will what length to make that now I've also found it easier to do this in batches if you do this for one small bowl like we're doing you'll spend a lot of time a lot more time cutting and, and adjusting your saw to each piece than you would uh, to actually turning the, the final bowl so for this project here, I'm actually going to do six bowls and then I'm going to demonstrate assembling one of them. And then the other five will be kits um, that I provide to the club for sale. So with that, we'll move on to cutting the segments. Now for the segments here, I'm using a, a Seg Easy sled and you can again find these plans online. Um, there's different versions of this seggy sled available, seg easy sled, I think is what a lot of people call them. Um, I made this one out of MDF and then I added uh, this clamp to the top of it here and I use these uh, adjustable uh, wing nuts to make everything work for me. This has worked out pretty well. Um, you want a good tight fit in the runner of your table saw if you do it this way. Um, and you want to, that stuff tends to move over time. So you want to make sure that you adjust it each and every time that you use it, uh, which is what I've done here. Now you'll also find, um, projects out there for the, to measure the distance from the blade to the fence. The method that I use, um, is with this block of wood here and I slide it back and forth along my fence. I have found, uh, that to be pretty accurate. And I like the way that that works because then it leaves this drop off area here for the pieces to fall off um, away from the blade. It's important to note here also that I'm using the zero clearance um, insert that I made for my table saw. And uh, by doing that with this little ramp that's attached to it, all the pieces tend to fall away from the blade. And as long as you clear this area between the blade and the fence, regularly uh, really minimizes the chance of uh, any kind of kickback without that little ramp and bla uh, ramp alongside the blade for those pieces to fall away you really increase the chance of a kickback which will probably ruin the the piece that gets thrown but it'll also potentially injure you and it's uh, isn't a very safe process so this is about the safest way that i have found to do it it is important to note that you could also do this with the uh, chop saw miter box. If you have, uh, again, I would have a zero clearance uh, kind of fence for that and a stop system so that you could make repeatable cuts. I've just never tried it that way, but I know I've seen other videos where it can be done that way. Okay, so this is the kit that you're going to receive uh it's gonna have all the pieces you need inside and the first thing that you're going to want to do is take it out and set this piece here aside it may not look exactly like this it's going to be a flat piece of stock that you're going to use for the very center bottom uh, set that aside and we will deal with that later on so the next thing is uh, probably to just dump all this out into a big pile. And what you're gonna notice right away is that you have a whole bunch of different size uh, pieces. So go ahead and sort these into various piles. Now, as I do that, I like to go ahead and if you'll notice here, uh, if I can get a good shot of that, some of these pieces have uh, a little bit of a rough edge on them, like this right here. 
you want to go ahead and pull those off as you're sorting them out because you're going to want a clean edge here. That's just a little bit of residue left from the table saw. What's on the outside here is probably not that, that critical, but this uh, face that's on here needs to be nice and clean all the way around. So um, as you do that, just uh, sort them out as such. Uh, you're going to have 12 of each size of a uh, piece and then you're going to have five different rings that we're going to uh, compose so start making your piles it's pretty obvious when you look at them um, what the various sizes are and right now the the order that we glue these rings up doesn't matter at all but you do want to have uh, all of your different size pieces there's the the five right there. Uh, you'll want to have those in distinct piles. It'll just be easier um, as we glue those up. So I'll spread them out as I go. Make sure that you have 12 of each. There might be the occasional kit where there's actually um, an extra one in there as I was uh, counting, but I know none of them have fewer than that. So, uh, as you can see, as I'm going along, I'm just kind of cleaning those up best that I can. Uh, you might notice that as I'm doing this, I'm on a white board um, that has nothing to do with the video or uh, trying to make things show up better, although it does do that as long as you can keep the glare down. It... Uh, what it is is a piece of melamine board and I have found that rather than have glue and schmutz all over my workbench, I would, uh, it's very easy to clean this up with um, a wet sponge or, and or razor blade when you have dried bits of glue on it. I've also used it for some different paint things, uh, stain, that kind of thing that you might also see on it. So pre-pandemic, um, a two by four sheet of this melamine at a place like Menards uh, was, I think, eight dollars. And I've been using this piece now for probably uh, going on five years. Last, uh, it's pretty durable. I've used both sides of it at times, but uh, post pandemic, I don't way lumber prices are, I have no idea what that would cost now, but it's still probably fairly inexpensive for something that's gonna last you five years of uh, doing this. All right, so we'll get these all sorted out and uh, we'll come back to that. So uh, after you sorted all these pieces out, what you're gonna notice is you got some detritus and a bunch of uh, little bits of wood left on the board. Go ahead and uh, we'll clean that off here at this point. You want a nice clean surface to make sure that these rings sit flat on. Now you're going to need a few things here to get started. You're going to want a, just a bucket of water here with a sponge. I've used various sponges. Um, this one is actually a sponge from, uh, for cleaning grout, like doing a tile job. And I've just lopped the end of that sponge off of there. This sponge, um, actually is quite a bit bigger um, when you get it and then I just cut that off to make it easier to use. You're also going to want to have uh, some glue and I've always had good luck here with the Type Bond 2 which is the blue version. People also use the red version and they use the green version. Uh, the green version is fine, it's waterproof. This one is water resistant, the red is, is neither. Um, we're not going to be getting this bowl wet after we shape it anyway. But what I have noticed about the green is if you're using a lighter colored wood like maple, uh, that you might get some glue lines that show because that just has a little darker color when it dries. This one does not and neither does the red. Using this butternut, um, it's probably not gonna be a problem. I like to use a smaller, um, bottle here and that's the most expensive way to buy this glue but i bought that bottle years ago and then i buy a bigger one like this one and i will go ahead and uh, refill it as i as needed and that's this small bottle is a lot easier to handle you're going to want some hose clamps 
Um, now, you can go to Menards or Lowe's or wherever and buy some various size hose clamps. Um, try to guess at what size you're going to want for each size ring. That's kind of what I did in the beginning when I started doing this. And I'll, I'll tell you, you just never seem to have the right size ring. So uh, you might be better off buying a larger clamp like these. Uh, again, these are available at Menards. Um, not that this is a commercial for Menards, but they tend to have a lot of what I need when it comes to these projects. This hose clamp is not available in the plumbing section. It's actually in the HVAC section uh, with the ductwork. I think it's like $6.99, $7.99, something like that. You get two of them. And I've been using these same clamps for quite a while. They go from a very large size down to a very small size. I think they'll do up to about a 12 inch ring and something like down to two and a half inches or something like that. You'll have um, a little bit of a tail, or a lot of a tail, depending on the size, uh, hanging off there, but they work pretty good. And I've been using this, uh, these clamps like this for several years now. Um, I think you're going to see that there's a bunch of glue and debris on them that's uh, built up over the years, but they still work just fine, and you can use them over and over again. So we've got them all sorted out here into the various sizes. And what we're going to do is go ahead and build our first ring. It doesn't matter which size you start with. You can, uh, we're going to mash them all together later, but right now we just need to build the individual rings. So we've got our nice clean surface and we'll go ahead and start here with the largest uh, ring which is actually going to be the smallest pieces as far as uh, the size of the uh, what I want to say the edge that mes meshes together all right so we'll get our uh, bottle of glue and we'll lay them out to begin with I like to kind of do a dry layout um, to make sure that everything's just going to line up and that I got the correct number of pieces because uh, I think I mentioned you might have a little extra one at some point and because I miscounted. I don't think I've ever counted too few, but occasionally I've counted, uh, counted maybe too many. So I'll just line them up, make sure I got the right number of pieces and that everything looks like it's going to fit accordingly. It's kind of difficult to visualize as you're uh, just laying them out but as we can see here this is forming a rough circle everything looks like it's going to be okay so we'll go ahead and move on to gluing we'll get our clamp of the approximate size there so that we're ready to go with that and i think i just told you to use those giant ones but i happen to have these sitting on the bench so i'll go ahead and use one of those all right we'll get our clamp down to about the approximate size all right now we're ready to go We'll just start applying a little dab of glue to each piece. I think what you'll see here is not much because I'm off camera. So you put a little bit of glue on each one and then just mesh them together and make sure it's just its own spreader. You're not going to need a glue brush. You don't really even need to use your finger to smear it around. You're just going to put a little dollop on each one and then squish them around and make sure that you get 100% coverage on that. You can feel it as you're doing it. Um, if you don't, if you got a dry spot, you can kind of tell. So then you'll just keep uh, putting those together, working your way around the ring. That's about how much I put on right there. 
and you're going to have some squeeze out. If you don't have any squeeze out, that's a problem. You should have uh, plenty of squeeze out. And it really doesn't matter how much because we're going to clean it up here in just a minute. So once we get these all tied together here, I'm going to go ahead and put a hose clamp on that. And I use the hose clamps. I think if you go to the club's YouTube channel and watch Dale Hupp's presentation on uh, the segmented beads of courage box, Dale has his own method of gluing up his rings. Uh, he's got a little jig that he's put together to do that. You could also watch Don Coleman's video on segmented turning. And if I remember correctly, he had like a string and a twist set up where he would tighten up the rings that way. I, I use the hose clamps. That's just what works good for me. Uh, as you're tightening this down, what you're going to find is if you kind of look at the lower left corner by my forearm there, you got a piece that is uh, tried to wander its way to the middle a little bit and that'll happen some of them will want to kick in towards the middle and you just uh, as you get a rough snug bit here on the uh, on the hose clamp then you can adjust those as needed so right now we've got an approximate shape we'll pop that one back into place and it is important that this stays flat as you tighten this up that thing is going to want to flex a little bit and or bow and maybe the uh, not be flat so go ahead and put that, uh, keep it flat, snug it up pretty good. Um, you want it good and tight and just make sure that you don't see any gaps in any of the uh, segments around there. So once you have it tight, then we're just going to take some water and uh, that bucket of water with the sponge here and wipe it down and just get all that excess glue off of there now the first time i saw somebody do this i kind of freaked out because wood and water typically aren't something you want to do you don't want to saturate that wood but in this case uh, the end grain is protected at this point with that water resistant glue and it, you're really not doing any harm to the wood go ahead and clean off both sides nice and uh nice and well you don't have to worry um, about the outside where the hose clamp is or the inside. Um, it just doesn't matter. Um, that little bit that's on the inside that I'm wiping off here, just it's irrelevant really because you're going to turn that out anyway. So once you have that wiped away, go ahead and set it aside and then wipe down the board. This is where that melamine comes in real handy because you can just really easily um, wipe up the excess glue. And then that, that wet spot on this melamine tends to dry just within a few seconds. Uh, so then now that we've done the thinnest pieces, we'll go ahead and do the thickest. And by thickest, I mean the longest uh, edge joint there. And again, I'm going to put it together um, in a way so that I know ahead of time uh, that everything's going to mesh up. Now, as I'm putting this together here, Visually, it almost looks to me like they're not going to line up. And if that's the case, that would have been okay because um, I can show you how to fix that by sanding it. But um, once I get them all put together here, uh, everything was fine. So we'll go ahead and move on to the process of gluing that. Now, if you had a problem with them lining up, typically what I would do is glue up what I call a half ring and I'll show you that here and uh, we'll pull this apart and glue them together and then let them dry as a half ring and I think if you do a good job um, smooshing those and sliding them around to make sure you got a good tight joint they will dry up on their own overnight and they'll be pretty durable and so then the next thing you do is take them the next day uh, over to a disc sander or I have a edge belt sander, you know, uh, what is it, Rigid, Home Depot brand, whatever. Um, and you'll sand along this edge and that edge on each ring. You want to do the opposite because then you're going to have the uh, 
I don't know what do they call that complementary angles and it'll glue back up and then now that you you would have it put together as such you would put your hose clamp on and tighten everything up and you'll be good to go with that ring also so uh, we'll go ahead and glue this one up now and all we're going to do is the same process that we did on the other one uh, we'll get our hose clamp approximated and we'll start applying glue to the edge now that we're on these bigger pieces you're going to use quite a bit more glue i think you'll find this butternut actually um, absorbs quite a bit of the glue as it's going on if you're using a really hard wood like maple or um, jatoba purple heart something like that rosewoods that are pretty hard um, it's not going to absorb the glue as much and maybe you don't have to put as much on but this uh, butternut really kind of soaks it up pretty good. So there again, we have our 100% uh, coverage on our mating surfaces there. So we'll just go ahead and work our way around and tighten up our hose clamp. And then we'll wipe down these surfaces and we'll set this aside to dry overnight and we'll come back uh, with all of them glued up tomorrow and we'll start stacking them and gluing those together. So we are back and the rings have dried actually uh, for a couple of days. So we're gonna go ahead and pop these bands off them. As you can see, the glue tends to stick a little bit and that's why you end up with uh, the, that's why you end up with the residue uh, inside there, but you can reuse them over and over. Pretty strong, pretty solid uh, ring. Now that the glue has dried, we'll go ahead and show you a couple of ways to flatten them. So really at this point, no matter what you do, there's gonna be uh, just little surface ridges and perfections on there that uh, where they just don't quite sit exactly flat and you're going to want them flat. Otherwise, uh, when you put them together, they will be just little tiny, uh, I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but little tiny gaps that will form there and you'll have kind of a sloppy joint. So they have to be absolutely flat. So I'll show you uh, the first method that I'm going to show you is over on the lathe and that's just a flat sanding disc and then the next one will be the much easier way which is a drum sander so here i'm at the the lathe this is but one method uh to sand these flat uh, i think if uh, you watch dale hupp's video on the youtube club's youtube page there's a uh, method that he uses with a board uh, to kind of flatten his rings you can um, certainly take a piece of sandpaper and glue it to a sheet of plywood or something MDF that's absolutely flat and, you know, um, rub your rings on it like, like so until you get them nice and flat. Usually there's not a whole lot of work to be done there. One method that I started with before I had my drum sander was I just took a piece of MDF and mounted a faceplate to it, turned it around and uh, took this self-adhesive sandpaper from Harbor Freight, I think it's a, I think it's 120 grit, and put it on there and I had a nice flat uh, disc sander. Now I'm gonna show you here in just a second 
how I do that, um, but what you'll notice is even with a good dust collector, um, you almost need like a sheet or something over you because dust tends to go everywhere. I have like an air collection, um, air circulator dust collector in my shop, and then I have a um, dust collector hooked up to the hose and you still are gonna end up with a lot of dust in your shop. So just be aware, I'll demonstrate this quickly and then I'll show you the way I prefer to do it. All right, it's turned up around uh, 1300 RPM there. And you have to hold on tight. Uh, it's probably hard to see on the video, but a lot of that dust is going into the dust collector. But I guarantee you a lot of it also is not. Then what I like to do is just, just feel the rings. You'll feel a little bump or a ridge if you still have one. And once it's uh, smooth, I call it good. But notice I rotate it, trying to keep it fairly even on the amount that's being uh, taken off so it'll sit flat afterwards. So, uh, you have to be careful. If you got a big one, you kind of put it in the middle. You got a small one like this, you can set it off to the side. So that's just uh, but, but one example of a way to do that. And now I'll show you my preferred method. Okay, so this is my preferred method of doing this. Um, this is a Supermax 1632 drum sander. Jet makes a similar product. Um, basically, you lay these down. Lay your rings on there, run them through the sander a couple times on each side and you're done. You have much better dust collection here than what you had before. Um, it's just a quick and efficient way to do it. Now, certainly understand not everybody has a dedicated or a drum sander in their shop, but if you do, this is a good way to do it. This is, um, if I remember correctly, it was around, this is usually around about a $1,200 piece of equipment. Black Friday sale, maybe it's a thousand bucks. So it's definitely a pricey add on to your shop, but for something like this, it makes it go very quickly. Okay, so in this first kit, the top two rings are pretty similar in size. So basically what I do is um, center up top ones, one with the thinnest pieces. I take the next one. Uh, you might want to look at it and make sure you're happy with which side is up. If you're doing a multicolored um, bowl, the order that you assemble as far as stacking the rings is important. This is a solid color and it's not important. And also it's important to know the way I cut the segments. I didn't follow um, the rule of alternating on my wedgie sled so that they would all have kind of the similar grain pattern. So it just, it really doesn't matter for this bowl. Um, so I'll line them up the best that I can. And, and with this one, the um, the tips of this next ring are really just gonna hit um, the outside edge of the other one. And you want the joints, of course, staggered um, halfway in between each is the strongest way to do it. So I will just, um, see me kind of leaning over there to deal with that. I will make sure that I have everything uh, lined up about as good as I can get it. Sometimes I don't trust 
uh, eyeballing it, and I'll actually take a little ruler and try to measure it. But when the when the uh, tips touch the edges like this one does, it, it's really pretty easy to just eyeball it and line it up. And of course, you got to hold it in place, not let it slide like I just did. Uh, that looks pretty good. All right. So once I have it where I want it, I'm going to kind of hold it down and then I'll just trace the outside of this. Uh, all the way around. So I got a reference mark. Now you can do these kind of as you go or you can do them all at once like I'm going to do here. Once I have my marks drawn, then what I do is I go on uh, each edge at three different points around the bowl and I make a little tick mark. And I'll put like a one right there and I'll come, you know, about a third of the way around the bowl. I'll make a little tick mark there, and that'll be number two, and then I'll come down here, make my V mark, little tick marks, whatever you want to call it, and label that one number three. Now I'll give you a, see if we can get a better view of that on the camera. Um, but basically we want that to the little marks that I made to line up right there so that we we know when we press them together how they need to go so that's the first ring um, the next ring down is gonna be this big one now the big one here doesn't quite hit out to the edges like the other one did so what I like to do for that, set the bottom one aside, is I use this template here that I got from Craft Supply. It's got some holes so that you can draw a circle. And um, I found this to be a pretty handy little thing for, I think it was around 15 bucks, which I guess seems a lot for a piece of plastic. So that circle there is about six inches out on the points. Um, so I'll take this piece of just a piece of plywood that I have put like an 832 screw through it and I will set this piece on there and then using that six inch circle again kind of doing this by eye but you can certainly throw a little ruler to it if that helps you um, Kind of eyeball that so that it's centered up. Um, scooch this way. Of course, scooch being a technical measurement term. Uh, that looks pretty good. So then what I, I will uh, draw a circle on that ring. Again, if you didn't have a perfectly flat ring here you would catch on all those joints so now that I have a circle drawn on there set that aside and we'll go back to lining this up and using those uh, that circle pencil line as a good indicator of how to center this next piece on the board doesn't have to be absolutely perfect as you're turning it you're gonna you'll make it round again but the closer you are here the easier it'll be during that turning process and again you're wanting to stagger the joints and once you have that lined up kind of the way that you want it take your pencil again and you're gonna draw the shape of the ring so that you have you know where it goes and then to make sure that you have everything lined up um, the other way is I like to make these tick marks and number them so that it, when I go to the press here in a minute you'll see what I mean by all this all right with these marks then when we go to the press here 
in a couple of minutes you'll see how everything kind of lines right up and eliminates your guesswork all right and then this bottom ring is just under five inches Oh, we'll go to the board again. We'll center it up the best that we can. And I'm going to draw a five inch circle, but the I'm using the six inch line as my lineup template. Uh, template so that I know where to center it. Okay, we got our next line. And we'll try to get this one lined up. Using those lines again as just a visual guide. Hopefully we're uh, pretty close. Now this one sits well inside the circle, but the circle's still a good a good guide for keep putting my head in the way there. Sorry about that. Uh, this circle is a good guide to get that centered up just about as good as you can. And then we'll go ahead and we'll draw that line. Trace that out, put our tick marks, hash marks on it, and Move on to the next step. All right, now that you have your rings all set up, uh, what we're going to do is start stacking them together. So basically what you're going to have is out of these four rings, you're going to um, stack them with the bowl and basically what is upside down as such. You go to your largest ring, your second ring, your kind of big, big fat one that you have here, and then this is the actual bottom. Now the very smallest ring that you have here is going to be an inside ring that we're going to turn out uh, to, to nest your, uh, your bottom piece here. Once we turn this piece around, that's going to go inside the bottom. So um, that's the method that we're going to use. Now, how do you clamp all those together? Now, there are people out there that will tell you to do two or three at a time. I'm not good enough to do that. Um, they tend to slide around on me a little bit and do things that I don't like them to do. So I will uh, do two rings, glue them together, uh, wait about an hour, and then add the next ring to it and then wait an hour and add the next ring to it. Once I've uh, glued them all together, I let it sit at least overnight, um, 12 to 24 hours before I turn it on the lathe. Again, there I've seen people out there that'll tell you within a couple hours, you can go ahead and turn it on the lathe. I've never been that brave because I didn't want it to come apart on me. Um, so w when you get them together um, like this and I'll, kind of try to show you on this other camera a little better view of the hash marks that I have. Let's see here. But basically you want everything to line up. You want everything to line up. I make these little V marks um, on the wood so that I'm trying to do it backwards so that everything lines up perfect all the way around. We'll go over here. Sometimes you got to shift them. So there's the uh, number one marks and then the number three marks are over here. I don't know if you can see that real well, but uh, once I have them lined up, then the question is, what do you, how, how do you keep them in place or uh, clamp them together. What do you do? I've seen people take uh, something heavy like a bucket of paint or joint compound and put that very carefully in place. 
and then let that sit for your hour. Um, I think people have been pretty successful doing that. I did that that way initially, but you gotta be really careful that things don't shift around on you. Another way that I have tried somewhat unsuccessfully, uh, well, I guess I've done it a couple of times, but this way I think is kind of a pain in the butt too, but if you have a way to get to the corner, maybe of your workbench and put a clamp on each side and hold it in place that way. Um, obviously this is slid out of center, but you can do something like that. You could add, you know, some, now this is a long piece, but you know, if you had to put some calls across there, mount that down, you could do that. However, just like everything else, I'll show you my preferred method. Now, this requires a little bit of work on your part, but not a lot of material. This here is a wood press. Uh, you'll find the plans for this, I think, out on Woodcraft's website. Um, if you just Google um, a press for segmented bowls or something to that effect, you'll find this design. Um, I modified mine just a little bit. I thought theirs was almost a little bit over-engineered. Um, take some heavy stock up top and then you turn a handle. This is, I think, three-quarter inch threaded rod and the rest of the stuff pretty much had on, on hand. These are um, electrical standoff um, pieces here that you can go to Menards and buy a chunk of that for 10 bucks or something. Um, so this is the system that I use now because I found it really holds things in place. You can get some real good pressure on it. I have, um, I don't know if you can see this here, maybe I'll switch to this other camera. Some of my lines are fading, but I took the time um, to draw circles, uh, whatever that is, every quarter inch or so around there, half inch and that way it helps me center everything up so that i know that i'm getting a good um, pressure and it's it's centered and then on the unit itself uh, on the base there's just a little dowel pin here and a dowel hole that's in the back uh, of this piece right here so that that can sit on there Sit on there like so and and spin so you can move things around so we'll go ahead and get our first two glued up for this then uh i'm gonna try to get a shot of this on both both cameras for you okay so how much glue do you use i tend to put a healthy bead around it and that come out of the bottle right uh a little clog in there i think so that might be a little little heavy actually but again i i use my fingers i don't use a brush i just kind of try not to erase my line with the glue this has got a lot on it yeah there's a, there's a lot here uh Maybe a little too much and it'll run down the inside, which is okay. You're going to turn it away anyway. It just kind of makes it messier. And no sense being messier than we have to be. So I'm actually going to take this and squeegee off a little bit. Just, it's already running. There. You want it to be almost kind of, you can see through it a little bit. So, there's my number two mark, my number three, my number one. So, now I will go to this ring. Da. Okay. So I did this backwards. Why not, right? We're making a video, we might as well make a mistake. So what I should have done was put my glue on this ring here, centered this one on it. We'll come back and we'll do them a little bit out of order. So this is the next ring that goes down. Um, this is gonna be the fat one. So 
for clarity, this is the second ring in the bowl. We should have used this one. That's my fault. I will show you how to glue this one up once this one dries. So uh, my number two and my number one. So there's my number two. And we'll get these lined up. We'll slide these around until all of our little marks uh, match up. They will, this thing will be pretty slick and easy to turn, which is why I like, I like this press because then it helps me center everything up, know where it is. And kind of line everything up in place. All right, once I have it where I want it, then I carefully lower this into place. Everything's there, and then we'll spin this down. And I think this is similar to like an old book press that they would use binding press. But for our purposes here, it's a horrendous sound that's making. All right. Once we have it snug down here, it's just a matter of getting it tight. You don't have to go real tight, but you want it snug to hold everything in place. And now that that's tightened up, we'll go ahead and we'll let that sit for an hour. We'll come back, I'll do the ring that I had out of order. And then in another hour, we'll put the, the bottom piece on, we'll let it sit overnight, and then we'll be able to turn it. Okay, it's been a couple of hours. Uh, we're going to go ahead and loosen this up. Slide it out. This is, uh, this is what we have. There's uh, a little bit of glue in the bottom there. Um, as I mentioned, I kind of did these out of order. So we'll go ahead now and... Uh, that's going to be our top piece. We'll go ahead and glue that one on next. Try not to put quite as much glue on this one. So I have to wipe it off. Really just a little, little bead around there. And then uh, use a spreader that God gave you. Go ahead and Make it into a thin film all the way around. Okay. It's pretty good. And we will use our previously marked spots to line everything up we'll slide it in place here loosen it up just a little I found with this if you loosen it up and kind of Tilt that, it'll stay in place. All right. Let's, let's pivot to our check marks. Make sure everything looks pretty good all the way around. Get it centered up in the press. Gently set that down, crank her down. And we'll let that set for an hour and we'll come back uh, and do the last piece. Okay, so we're back again after letting this dry for an hour or better. And uh, we'll go ahead and throw on our last ring for this little bowl. We'll let that sit overnight and then uh, tomorrow we'll turn it. 
a little bit of glue that drizzled down certainly not a big deal and then we will put our final ring now you're gonna have your two rings left here this small one you're actually gonna turn to go inside the other one at some point so you want that uh, the bigger of the two and let's see here you can see I've got it marked and number two goes right there it's gonna fit right in just like that clean off our glue tip now this one obviously is a little wider area in here so we'll put a little bit more glue and again just use our finger spread that around Sure you cover all the areas good so you get a good seal obviously we're going to turn some of this away but all right and here we go our marks lined up that looks that looks about perfect all right good enough for the girls i go with all right get it centered up here we'll very Gently set that down, tighten her up. And now we're gonna let this one sit overnight and tomorrow we'll turn it. See you then. Had a battery microphone die, so I had to redo the audio for this portion. So if my lips aren't in sync or my motions, uh, that's what's going on here. All right, so at this point, what we have is a basic shape of a bowl. And uh, there's four segmented rings here sandwiched together. And we're going to put this over onto the cold jaws, mount it to the lathe. We're going to turn out the bottom of it so that we can flip it around and mount it on a normal chuck. Um, and we'll go from there. So for these cold jaws, what I like to do is... Um, set it on the uh set the pins up so that they're on the inside with that gripping the inside we can work on the bottom of this thing we can enlarge this hole so that it, it uh, will contain not only our floating bottom but it's also a way for us to mount our chuck to the bottom of it so this is a nova infinity chuck that's what i tend to use I think for this particular project, we're going to use these larger set of jaws for part of it, and we're going to use a smaller set of jaws for the inside of it. So um, I have templates that I've made for each of my size of uh, jaws that I use. And as you can see, there's uh, two semicircles that match the inner and outer, or the smallest diameter of the jaws when they're closed and then the largest when they're open and then I have these two spigots that are turned on there that match the um, largest inside diameter that they can grip and uh, the other side is the smallest inside diameter that they can grip. So I have the same type of template. This one actually matches these jaws here and you can see what I mean about the uh, semicircle matching the size uh, that the jaw will hold so when you look at this um, bowl here when we if we wanted to mount it on the outside we could with that uh, larger one but if we wanted to use an inside mount 
that larger set of jaws is just too big so we're going to use this smaller set and then I'll just switch the jaws in between. And you can do this a variety of different ways. Um, you can use the coal jaws or you can use um, a different setup. By using the coal jaws with these pins, uh, and these pins are not the factory pins, these are a separate set that I bought, like an expansion set of pins or something that Nova offered. I like the way they hold much better. But if you don't have that, you can create, this is just a flat piece of uh, plywood, and I use that same craft supplies template to draw circles um, around it, and then I put a face plate on the back of it, and um, you can use like double-sided tape to mount that bowl down, you know, flat on that, bring up your tailstock, and you can do many of the same things. You are going to um, have a little more difficulty hollowing out the inside because for that portion of it, you cannot have the tailstock brought up, so you need a firm grip on it. I've wrapped this thing with tape. I've done this a couple of different ways where I've actually taken tape and wrapped it across and, and around the back side of it and that's held it pretty good along with, with tape on the face so that you can stick it that way. Uh, my cold jaws and the template that I just showed you are actually have a, a one by eight thread on the face plate that's attached to that flat template. And the cold jaws are an older G3 chuck. It was the first chuck I ever bought. And now I just kind of leave those cold jaws more or less permanently attached to that. So I need an adapter on my larger one and a quarter by eight threads that are on this lathe here. So what we're going to do as we mount this is we're going to start enlarging that bottom ring. And uh, that, as I mentioned, once we enlarge it, that's going to contain our floating bottom. But we're going to cut it to a size so that our jaws will fit on the inside of that and we can mount it that way. Now I don't know if you can uh, spot this but that pin that I just touched right there is actually uh, one position further in than it should be. I got lucky here when I mounted this up. Uh, you couldn't even tell that that was a problem but it's easy to do with these cold jaws if you're not paying attention like I was not. So be sure to pay attention yourself. Now, as you can see, we're a little bit out of round just from the way we glued it up, but that's pretty close. And once we start uh, cutting, everything will, will look pretty good on it. So I like to, once we enlarge this bottom hole, then we're gonna work on the outside a little bit while we're in this position, just because I find it easier to do it from here. So for this uh, particular Thing. I like to use this uh, carbide scraper that I have. This is a Rikon tool set that comes with, uh, I think, a square round and a detail, like a point scraper. I like it because um, that square carbide has a cutting surface on two edges, and I can uh, kind of drive it in there and enlarge the hole and work on the depth all at the same time. You can do this with a different scraper or a bedan or whatever your tool of choice is, uh, maybe even a bowl gouge. But this works pretty well for me here. All right, so we're ready to start enlarging this hole. Just kind of check our tool rest height, get everything locked in place. And uh, these cold jaws have a limit of uh, about 600 RPM they want you to stay under when you're using them. So uh, once we get this enlarged, if you wanted to bring up the tailstock for support, you could. Uh, but while you're enlarging that hole, you're pretty much left with your, your holding method that you have. Um, you'll notice as I'm cutting this that at first it's a little bit rough because it's a 12-sided circle instead of a real circle. Uh, but pretty quickly it gets shaped into the circle and you'll start making some pretty long uh, shavings which is always kind of amazing to me that uh, speaks to the testament of the strength of that glue you're cutting you know basically a paper thin shaving out of there and you will end up with a big long um, string of shavings where that glue is holding together each segment and that glue joint too is also just paper thin and it uh, does a pretty good job. We'll check it with our template periodically. Right now it's 
too small for even the smallest uh, size of the jaws to work, so we'll keep enlarging it. You have to be careful as you're doing this. You don't want to go through into the next, um, the next larger ring because you want a lip there for your um, bowl bottom to float in. Um, also, if you were to slip and go through there and hit your coal jaws, that would probably damage your tool and uh, all kinds of bad things would happen. So you want to be pretty careful as you're doing this. You could put like a piece of plywood or something in there kind of floating to keep you from hitting the coal jaws should you have a slip. If you're worried about that, I'd recommend doing that. Okay, so we barely uh, fit in our smallest one now, so we'll enlarge it just a little bit more so we're kind of in between. And again, there's a good graphic of uh, how long those strings of wood can get with just that uh, they're paper thin and that glue is holding everything together so you can end up with a string that's uh, pretty long actually if you were to lay it out end to end. And that's just another look at uh, what I was just talking about. So at this point, we've got it uh, where we are bigger than the smallest and smaller than the biggest so that we know our jaws will fit in there and can open up and, and hold that uh, piece just fine. So we will move on um, to the next portion of the video. Another thing that I like to do at uh, this point is we'll go ahead and Take a little bit of this, um, smooth this part out um, just while we've got the, the bowl turned around. It's easier to, to hit these pieces uh, with it there like that. If you're fortunate enough to have some cone center that maybe will um, fit into that piece, you can bring up some tailstock support and it's even, even better just to hold it onto those cold jaws. So I do happen to have that. So I'm gonna go ahead and use my cone center. All right, we're just gonna use a half inch bowl gouge. really tell the difference where you're smoothed out and where you're not so this this uh, outside ring here or this next one up takes uh, you really got to take some meat off of the outside of that to kind of get to your shape You do want to be careful here. You don't want to get into your cold jaws. That could be, uh, notice I slipped a little bit there. That could have been nasty. Just kind of rubbing the bevel. top one until I get her turned around. So we're getting close um, to kind of a shape that we're going to have on this this bowl. Um, you can certainly uh, cut this in and then and then make a more, more pronounced foot and that's probably what I'm going to do here just to clean that up.
Okay, that's just going to be kind of the rough shape there on the outside of this. While I'm here. Still a little flat through there. Maybe a little shear scraping. All right, that's just kind of the rough shape of it. And now that we have it here, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll turn it around and take care of this this top portion. And oh, looks like I got a little bit of a gap in one of my rings right here, so we'll deal with that as we go through. That's interesting. Okay. So at this point, we'll back it off. We're gonna flip it around. You're gonna lose a little bit of your trueness by moving it to a different chuck. But that's the way it goes. All right, I wasn't uh, gonna show this because people don't typically wanna see changing chuck jaws and whatnot. Um, But for this particular case, I just, uh, if you're looking at a chuck or not sure what to buy for a chuck, I have found uh, this one to be super handy. This is the, uh, the Nova chuck. And what it is is a quick change, change chuck. And it has these little, uh, I don't know what you call them, um, an adapter on the back of them it works with any of their their jaws but then you can very quickly uh, switch these out they're numbered just like any set of jaws so there's the the number two the number three so as you can see um, compared to loosening eight screws and uh, putting them back in this way is much quicker. Always make sure that they're snugged up well. But uh, this chuck uh, really speeds things up for me. I really, really, really like it. Oop, gotta use the right end. Apologize, I keep getting my mask in the way. Now, as you expand this, you wanna be careful that you. Don't put a lot of pressure on there because you can actually split your rings. Okay, we lost a little bit of our trueness, which I expected. So now we'll go ahead and uh, so go to the next step. And we will take the top uh, round. And uh, what I like to do is kind of shape it from the outside and then uh let's see here i thought we had a ring that didn't look too great yeah this one right here looks just a little a little bit of a gap there like maybe wasn't that snug so we'll fix that with a little ca glue and some sawdust and i'd probably hardly notice it first i want to get this uh, shape down on the outside then, then we'll hollow out the middle. I'm gonna approach this kind of either direction. I'm gonna come from the back. Just cause I already kind of have it established there. So the nice thing is there's no end grain. 
so we can kind of shape it both directions without having to worry about much tear out try to get it trued up I can't uh, I can't watch my monitor and turn at the same time so I apologize if I'm getting my uh, mask in the way there all the time we're getting there You can kind of feel as you rub the bevel where you're, you've got it trued up and where it starts to skip. There's a little bounce right in here. Feel just a little bit of a little bit of a bump right through here. Better, better, better. Okay. So then to kind of smooth that out a little more, try to drop my rest down, get it in fairly close, and then I'm going to try to do a little bit of shear scraping. That steep angle really smooths it out. We get that real fine angel hair shavings off of that that's how you know you're doing it correctly so a little bounce right through there Better angle out here. This butternut is real soft, fairly soft. So you do want to take care with it. You end up with some tear out, even though we're not uh, dealing with end grain. It's so easy to tear. So right now I've got it. That's pretty good. I've got a couple of little rough spots, like I said, from the grain of that. But that's our material. I'm going to sharpen this up and uh, take one more pass at it, shear scraping with a super sharp tool and then we'll uh, go to the inside all right i'm back with a sharpened tool we're going to do one more pass here um, 
Actually, before we do that, I'm going to take a uh, little bit of CA glue and we're going to, this one, this one little area right here, I'm going to fill that in. Okay, this is just a little bit of, uh, it's just a little bit of thin CA glue. And we're gonna take some of those angel hair shavings that we had. I'm just gonna rub them in there. Rub them in there nice and firm that looks pretty good okay i don't know how much of that you can pick up on the camera but it was bothering me and that's what matters all right we're back here we sharpened up our gouge Yep, that's a noticeable difference in how we're shear scraping. Sharp tools matter. Yeah, it's like butter. Okay. Just a little bit out here. Pretty good. All right, and there again, we've got some whisper uh, thin shavings. Works pretty good. We will be able to start sanding that with a pretty decent grit, pretty high grit. Okay, now that we have uh, the outside of this basically shaped, that's the way it's going to look. We'll go to the inside and here you just have to pay attention as you're going down there to make sure that you're leaving kind of a uniform thickness, but this will turn pretty easy down through there also um, looks pretty good so we'll give you a different angle of that and uh, again I'm just gonna use a half inch bowl gouge now um, I don't know if you've noticed or not um, but the tool rest that I'm using this is a robust I think they call it their J rest I really like this rest it's got you know a hardened steel top uh, which is very good, but it's got this bend to it. So I use this probably 80% of the time for everything because I will use the, um, I can get it over there better. I'll use the straight portion when I can. Um, and then when it comes to doing the inside of a bowl like this, it fits in there and uh, gives you, kind of lets you get down and scrape the bottom, do the sides. Um, oops, sorry about that. And then so I, I really do like this rest, but uh, robust J rest. I have to have it a little farther away than I would like to start with just because of this bottom edge. Once we start thinning this out, we'll be, it'll be good. You can kind of tell right away when you when you've got through the flat spots that are there. A 
little bit of flat left in this top ring and then we'll transition down. There's really a dramatic uh, drop across this bottom part. Now that we're got a little meat taken off there, I'll adjust my rest. flat spot and then we'll really dig into the bottom here. Looking good. As you approach this turn here, it's, it almost turns into a scraper because you lose some of your bevel. Alright, a little bit of a ridge. Now for this bottom section, if, if you try to get your, your bowl gouge in there, it's too flat. You're just, you're not gonna, um, you're using it almost like a scraper. So um, at this point, I would say either uh, go to some kind of a inside bowl scraper, such as, uh, such as this tool here, or um, even a round nose scraper, um, something like this, if that's what you've got. It, there's, either one of those will work fine. Otherwise, if you have it, um, this is a uh, bottom, what they call a uh, bottom feeder bowl gouge. It has a really steep angle, and that uh, gets in there and will do a lot better uh, a lot better job getting to that bottom. Now, the, the other important thing is you have to round out this, this inside piece right here. And there is a little bit of danger here, um, not much, because my jaws open up wide enough that they're a little bit wider than, than what this is. But at some point, as you start to open this up, those jaws are a potential hazard. And if your tool gets in there too far, um, it, it could be catastrophic. You don't want that to happen. So recommendation, if you have like a quarter inch or uh, maybe even an eighth inch thick piece of plywood or, or wood that you could put in between there, in between the jaws, not, not something that prevents the jaws from working and clamping, but just as a buffer, something that if you hit it in there, it's not going to hit the metal of the jaws. I've done quite a few of these, so I'm, I'm pretty used to that. But if you haven't, you need to be aware of, of that issue. All right, I'm going to see what I can do here with either a scraper or this bottom feeder bowl gouge. So notice how this uh, bottom feeder just kind of really uh, cuts that wood. You don't, you're not skipping along like you were with the other bowl gouge. And, and I don't mean to tell you either that you have to have this J rest in place. You could do this just as easily, a bowl this size. You could, I'll just kind of try to put this out and we'll pretend that it's a straight straight edge or a straight tool rest at this point and you'll see what I mean you, you can do the same thing So 
So before I get too much further, I'm going to define that circle in here and I'll use my, uh, change my position and my rest. And I think I will try to just use that square carbide scraper that I was using before. And all I'm doing here is taking just a little bit out. Make a round circle at the bottom. And again, you want to be very careful your chuck jaws are just beyond this piece. Because I'm right at the edge of, of making this circle about where my chuck jaws are. You don't want to really, I'm almost working the tool this way um, to instead of pushing because if I push, I don't want it to slip and go inside. Give that a feel, that's pretty good. All right, that's pretty good right there. Holes, I'm happy with where that hole is at. Now I'll go back to my bottom feeder here and try to take a little more out and then I'll sh we'll work on it with a scraper. And you want it, you want this inside part here to get down pretty thin, like, I don't know, eighth of an inch, maybe somewhere around there. That's about where I want that. Now I've got to kind of clean this area up in here. Um, there's a, there's kind of a, a bump in there so you can do that again um, with this but I'm probably gonna knock off a big part of the high spot there and then I'm gonna come back at this with the scraper just a second maybe get one more little spot up here Gonna use a round nose scraper here. Now I like to use a light when I'm doing this. Uh, really helps me see what's going on in there. And you can kind of see the shadow line of the ridges sometimes, but that light would be in the way and affect the video. So I'm not using that. All right, it's getting there. We've got, all right, just a little bit of roughness here, which is actually that butternut grain, I think as much as anything. And it does look like we need to we got just a couple little spots showing up from the segment that needs to be dealt with. I don't know if I can get in there with this scraper and do that or not. Might have to go back to the gouge just for a second. Just a little bit for you. Got 
just a little tiny spot down there that's still got to be dealt with. Just see the edge of the where the glue mark from the segmented rings was. Okay, that took care of those. Now we just gotta smooth that out. Okay, kind of like I did on the outside of the bowl, I'm going to go back to my um, grinder. I'm going to sharpen this up for one last pass, try to get the kind of the smoothest cut that I can. Be back in just a second with that. Okay, we're back. Sharpened up our scraper just a little bit. Yeah, it makes quite a difference. And again, I prefer to have a, a little skip out here. Prefer to have my light on. And if you have one, I recommend you use it for this. Uh, pretty good shavings there. Oh yeah, that's butter smooth. Okay, so now um, we've got this bowl shape. Now you can look at the thickness I would call oops, sorry I would call that a medium thickness uh, maybe a little toward the thin side you can definitely make it thinner um, if that's what you want you can leave it thicker if you like that but we're down to a pretty thin at the bottom there pretty smooth on the inside uh, we'll go ahead and just sand it quick and uh, normally again I would turn on my I think I would turn on my um, dust collection turn on my dust collection for something like this uh, but with the video and I'm just gonna it's a small bowl we'll deal with the dust in the shop later um, but I'm gonna sand this up and then I'll flip it around and we'll show you how to finish off the bottom uh, for sanding uh, as I mentioned I would normally uh, put on a dust mask of uh, some sort here and uh, then I would also turn on my dust collection and I have a, a collector that mounts here on the side of the lathe. I'm not doing that for purposes of the video um, so we'll deal with it that way just so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, for sandpaper what I like to use um, is any sandpaper I can get my hands on. Our, we're really fortunate in our wood turners club that we frequently uh, give away uh, sandpaper at our raffle uh, or it's not giving away you win it in the raffle but uh, so I've brought home some of that and I will cut up the discs if I can some of this is from sheet material I do like this serrated uh, sandpaper when I can find it so what I will typically do is start with something uh, 120 and then I will move from there. This one would be uh, 180, 220, 320, 400, and uh, depending what it is, up to maybe 600. So I have that uh, categorized here in a little drawer next to my lathe, and I'll use the sandpaper that way. Now, uh, I was turning this at around 600 RPM, I think, for everything I was doing um, as far as turning this. Uh, for sanding it, though, I turn it way down. Now, you can certainly use a power sander on this. You can use um, an inertia sander. Any of those things work fine for a little project like this. I've, I've done just fine using um just regular sandpaper by hand and i'll turn it down to around uh kind of 200 250 rpm if your sandpaper if you're doing it this way and you go very fast you're going to burn your fingers and it's it's not necessary you actually get a, a pretty good finish at this uh slower speed 
And a lot of times what I'll do, I'm gonna round that edge off just a little bit at the top of the bowl. All right, so that'd be inside feeling pretty good there. And we'll bring it around to the outside. Just move it back and forth. It's pretty good. So most lathes these days have a reversing function on them. So I will uh, turn this so that I, uh, now I'm gonna go in reverse. That really just helps uh, with your sanding, gets rid of the marks uh, better when you go both directions like that, provides a better finish. So I'll, I'll do both directions with each grit when I can. All right, so that'd be 120. Now, here's another thing that I do that I know not everybody does, uh, but I vacuum this off with my shop vac in between grits. Uh, some people will blow it off, some people just kind of wipe it off, some people do nothing. But if you're not, uh, if you're not blowing that off or getting that other uh, sawdust off of there, you're really doing a disservice because you're kind of re-sanding at the same grit until you get rid of all that dust. So we'll vacuum it off and then we'll go to the next grit. For the sake of the video, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna show you all the grits and all the sanding. We'll just come back to it when we're done. And, uh, but you get the idea from here. Um, each grit I vacuum in between, it's important. Okay, so now we've sanded this bowl uh, down to 600 grit. Feels pretty good, everything looks pretty good. So the last thing that we have to do, the last couple things actually, is we've gotta put a bottom in it because uh, right now we've basically made a uh, glorified funnel. So we've got to uh, take that bottom piece uh, that we had in the kit and we got to drop that into place and then we've got to make a, a ring to sandwich that, that in there and uh, then we'll call it good. Looks like that one little gap there uh, that I had to fill in, I can still see. I'm maybe not as happy with that as it could be. Uh, I don't know if you can see this on camera real good, but uh, this little joint right here. Okay, to begin, we've gotta take, let me lay some things out here. We've got to take um, this flat piece of stock that we had in your kit and that's got to cover up the bottom of this bowl. So as you can see, this isn't round. We're going to have to make it round. We're going to have to make it fit inside there. So uh, the way that I like to do that is I have several of these that I've made up from some scrap wood over the years. These are... Um, They've got a tenon put on the back so that they fit into my, my jaws. And then they're a flat surface. And then I just use double stick tape on there. And in this case, this one is gonna be too big because it's bigger around than this. So I've got some other little chucks here that I use for pepper mills and that, that when I use a jam chuck at the bottom, that'll work perfect. Basically, you, you wanna try to center this up on there about the best that you can. And then uh, we'll use some calipers and we'll turn it around. So I'll show you what I mean here. First of all, uh, let's get our jaws set up. 
but we know that'll fit. Okay. Grab some double stick tape. Uh, put a couple little chunks on there. Now the way I do it, and we'll figure out the way that works best for you, of course, uh, but I will put it on there. It's kind of the, the heel of my utility knife to just make sure there's a good solid feel on there and then I'll take that razor blade and just kind of cut away the tape the excess nothing real pretty going on here peel our backer off Okay, get her in our chuck. Now, actually I think to do this, it'll just go a little easier if I try to center it while it's uh, laying flat on the lathe. That's pretty good. Um, you got plenty of extra. Uh, these are cutoffs of some like weird shaped bowl blanks that I had, so that's why it's got the cut off corners on it and whatnot. So then the other thing that I like to do is provide a little more support with that piece. And I do that by using the tailstock and just a little little chunk of wood like this that mounts on my tailstock doesn't really mar the surface at all but it just helps with that grip of the tape all right so all this fanfare we're about ready to get started uh, so then the question becomes this how do you know what size uh, to make that thing I used to use some calipers definitely can use some cheaper ones than this uh, because frankly I am not using the measurement uh, function the digital readout on this at all I am just uh, using the teeth to see that I get that that proper size so as we turn this down we'll just keep checking it and eventually we'll have sure we got clearance on that throw on some safety glasses and we're ready to go and again, you can use about whatever you want here. This is that half inch bowl gouge that I had and uh, I turned the speed way down. So for this, I'll turn the speed back up. You're going to see the shadow lines of what you got going on there. Just little baby cuts because you don't want anything. That's a pretty thin piece of wood. Don't need a big chunk flying up and hitting you in the face like this one, like this one here could have done. Uh, you'll see from your shadow lines where the meat of your piece is, where where it is actually round. getting closer still not quite round you can see our flat spot right there
All right, we're just about round there, so we'll just take a quick peek with our calipers. And we're going to make her a little bit smaller. Now this is one of those things that's kind of using that in scraper mode wasn't working too good. Uh, this is one of those things where you want it, you want it snug, but not real tight in there. Uh, you don't want it to be bound up all the time because this wood's going to move a little bit, but you don't want it so loose either that if it's floating all over the place. All right, we're getting pretty close, I think. All right, it's a little bit. I'm going to go to a different tool. This is a flat scraper and I'm just taking very light bites at this point. There is ingrain coming around on this thing every time, so we want to make sure we get it in there close if I can. It's a little bit smaller. Just a touch smaller here. This is where things always go wrong for you. Just one more cut, one more cut, and then you got a problem. All right, so yeah, that's that's good right there. Um, now that we have this piece here, um, you can do this however you want. But for me, um, I like to sand it while I have it mounted here. You have to be a little bit careful um, doing that because it's just on there with double stick tape. But for me, this is where it works the best. Um, I think, yeah. So here, um, I just, I still have these same pieces of sandpaper. This is a really, you know, a small bowl, so you don't go through too much. So I just use the same, same grits that I did before. I'll start at 120. When these were uh, run through the drum sander, I think that was at, um, I don't know if that's a 80 or 100 grit that I have in that drum sander. So then the next thing here would be 120, 180, 220, 320, 400, and 600. Oop, I'm going to turn that speed down again and some 600. Now, now that you've got that, uh, what I'll do is peel it off and stick it to the other side. Sometimes you, you'll have to replace the tape um, to do that. So um, if that's what we got to do, that's what we'll do. And then we'll be ready for that final ring. Okay, uh, now that we've got this little piece sanded up, uh, fits right inside there. Maybe a touch looser than I wanted it, but it'll be fine once we sandwich the other piece in. Um, so then the last thing we have to do is take this ring here and uh, size it down so that it fits inside there. Now, this ring is way big. Um, the original plan for this bowl when I got it, I think had a solid bowl or, or a solid bottom on it, or maybe it was, I don't maybe it even had the segment in pieces that formed a perfect point. I did that a couple of times. Those never stay together as the wood moves. They, 
they come apart. So this ring is way big. Uh, it's going to be sized down. We're going to have to make the inside round and we're going to have to make the outside fit inside there. We'll swap out a couple of things on the lathe and uh, we'll go ahead and work on that. I've gone ahead and mounted this up in my cold jaws again. Be a little different view of that. So the first thing I'm going to do is try to make this inside rough edge here round. Now I don't want to make that too big because it's got to be, you know, this size of a ring to fit inside um, the other, the, the bowl itself. So I'm just going to come out, you know, maybe, I don't know, quarter, three eighths of an inch, make it round. And then, then we'll use these jaws to grab the inside of it, or I'm not sure if we use these or another one. We'll grab the inside of it and then we'll turn the outside. Now, same issues that we had before. If you go uh, with, if you take this tool and go in there too far, and hit those inside jaws you're gonna have a real problem so what I do and again if you had a piece of uh, as an insurance plan a piece a disc of maybe a eighth inch thick or quarter inch thick plywood to put in behind this you could certainly do that and then that would be a, a good safety precaution to take um, I've done this enough I'm and I don't have one of those handy right now. I'm kind of on a time crunch with this video, so I'm going to um, not do that. But what I'm gonna do instead is I'm only gonna go in about half depth um, with this tool, and then I'll turn it around and I'll cut the other side, other part from the other side. To, that's about the safest way that I have to do it right now. So again, we want to keep it under 600 RPM per the cold jaws recommendation. Oops, see right there, I slipped. Could have had a problem, but I... Okay, so that's probably not quite a little more than halfway, I guess. Okay. Okay, I believe I misspoke earlier. I said I was gonna turn the inside um, with the cold jaws and then move the uh, pins and turn the outside. Uh, my cold jaws will not go down small enough for this. When I do the bigger size bowls, um, then it does. But for this one, I have to use my other chuck. Um, so now that I, I had turned that inside uh, down, Turn this uh, round, I've mounted it on a chuck and now I'm gonna go for the uh, outside of that. Now, this again is the measurement that I had from the uh, inside of the bowl. I want you to note here, if I can show that, that this is um, gonna be smaller than the outside of these jaws. So once again, I'm gonna to wanna to come in and only go about half depth on this, and then I'll flip it over and do the other half so that I'm not getting into the outside of these uh, jaws as I turn it. Now this is important that you don't go too small here or you're gonna, it's not gonna fit right in your bowl. So you want it to be snug. And while we're all the way out here and I'm, I'm much bigger than the jaws, I'll go ahead and go all the way down. 
but when I start getting into my actual depth or my width, I'm going to have to stop, stop short. So, uh, in this case, that would be somewhere in there. Now, the other thing is, is if you can tell, I've got a little bit of a dovetail myself going on there. And you want to try to keep this flat. So when it fits into that bowl, it fits in snug. And let's grab my calipers. Oh, we got a long way to go yet. Now, another thing to note here is since we've already put that other piece in there, we're going to lose some of the depth of what we need. So having this little collar out here might not matter. You're going to trim that off anyway. We'll see what it looks like as we get closer. I'd rather keep checking it and find out I went too far. Well, a little bit of a dip in the middle. I don't want that. Want it to be as straight in as we can make it. That looks fairly straight. Let's see where we're at. Oh, where? There we go. That actually might be a little looser than I wanted on the bottom, but it's real snug at the top. So. To remedy that, I'm going to cut this, flip it around, cut this part off, and we'll go in the other direction, and I think we'll be fine. Again, we don't, at this point, this ring is pretty thin. We don't want to put much pressure on it at all. All right, let's see what we got there. It's a little proud. I'm going to leave it just as a buffer. Okay. I think that's our ring. Oh, it actually... <laughs> it, uh, let's see if we get a shot of that. Huh? It actually stayed in there when I pulled it off. So that's what it's going to look like. The problem is we need it out so that we can... Uh, Sandwich our other piece in there. There we go. That's a pretty good snug fit right there. And I think I'm going to leave it. So what we have at this point is dropping, we're going to drop this piece in. We're going to put our uh, ring in there now you can decide see that's a little a little loose now that it's standing proud let's try it this way and see yeah that feels a little snugger so uh again you can offset your you can offset your joints if you want to or you can line them up at this point the strength is it really doesn't matter um like that so we'll put a little bead of glue around that and then we'll uh, glue that in place and then what you're going to have left if you can see that on the camera that's is this piece is a little proud we'll put that back in our cold jaws or you can use a jam chuck or whatever your preferred method is probably what would not work is a vacuum chuck because there's an there's still air that could get through this bowl so uh, we'll we'll glue that in there and then we'll turn the bottom uh, make it flush and whatever finish you want to put on it there's your bowl all right we've just about reached the end of the show here um, i've inserted the um, inner ring and we have everything uh looking solid i let this dry for just about uh three hours i guess after i put that in there so we should be good to go i'm going to use my uh cold jaws again seems like we've used those a lot 
Uh, I'm going to mount that in there and we're just going to take this little nib off here, a um, little bit that's standing proud there. Uh, once we do that, we'll put some uh, finish on this and we'll call it good. Uh, for this, I'm going to go back to my just half inch bowl gouge and we're going to cut that. And, uh, you know, as we do that, um, we want to make, you know, the inside a little deeper here than the outside, just so it's sitting on that outside rim so we don't have any rocking. So that's uh, pretty much flat there, and then I'm going to come out. Cut that in towards the middle. It's pretty good. Pretty good finish. Uh, one thing you can do to kind of check that is use your bowl gouge or a straight edge against it. And you can see that it's a little shallower in the middle. And then the very last thing is to uh, just put a little sandpaper to that. And we'll put some finish on it.